Welcome in to the July 8th episode of the Locked On These Podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. Round one of the NHL draft in the books. The Maple Leafs did not make their selection at 25. Instead, used it to rid themselves of the Peter Morazic contract. But it's not as bad as it sounds. It's actually a good deal. I'll explain why in a sec. And Dave and I are also going to go over some of the best players available for the Leafs at pick number 38. And the surprise fall of Shane Wright, Dave, all the way down to fourth overall. First to fourth, just like that, plus reactions from all the other deadline deals made on the draft floor today. All that and more on today's edition of Locked On Leafs. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Locked On Leafs podcast, your one-stop shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother on TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me, it's my co-host, Dave Morissuti from Sportsnet, also a writer for the NHLPA. Locked On Leafs is a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe for free wherever you get your podcasts from. You can also now catch us up on video format on YouTube if you haven't yet. Go check it out. Please subscribe. That would be much, much appreciated. Uh, Dave, the first round of the NHL draft was uh, something. <laughs> it started with a bang. And for Toronto, it ended with a bang. Uh, I, I, dude, like right from the get-go, I got to say, this is probably one of the more entertaining, intriguing drafts that we've seen in a long time. All right. I hate to do this, but bravo, Montreal. Yeah. Because- actually, though. Give him a little round of applause because that crowd was electric, man. It was electric. And, hey, the first draft in, like, since 2019, right? So, like, first draft in basically three years that people have been able to gather for it. And they didn't disappoint, man. They put on a good show. Good show. And so did the rest of the GMs the entire day at that. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll get to a couple of the things I didn't care for in terms of the atmosphere. But I will say, like, the... Right, like the tension of like the first pick, although Bobby, Bob Margarita, Bob Woj, whatever you want to call him, yeah, keep, keep a little bit of suspense, guy. It'll just just a tad. Yeah, so the Bob father, Bob McKenzie, who considers himself half retired at this point, only rolls around for trade deadline, free agency the draft and world juniors. That's when you see Bobby Margs at work. And this guy had the scoop a couple of minutes before the, uh, the pick was officially made and he just tweeted out Yuri Slavkovsky period. That was it. That was it. And we all knew that meant that Yuri Slavkovsky was going to be the number one pick in the draft. And uh, I am happy about it for a couple of reasons, Dave. I made, Plenty of futures wagers on Yuri Slavkovsky. I put him, uh, the date was May 31st. So on May 31st, I placed a, a small wager, but it paid plus 1500 So it's 15 to 1 I got him at. So it was a pretty solid deal that I took him at uh, like a month and a half ago. And then today, as I started to hear, and it sounded like this was happening more and more, I put a little bit more money on it. I was like, okay, he's still paying he's still paying plus odds i'm gonna put some more money on it and then it closed as the favorite yuri slavkovsky closed as the favorite i I was looking an hour before the draft an hour before the draft maybe an hour and a half shane wright was still favored at minus 220 to go number one it ended shane wright was plus 115 and slavkovsky was favorited at minus 160 that's how the odds ended within an hour and a half of the draft. That's how quickly it all swung. It's just crazy. Like this, the whole year, I don't know if I've ever remember a draft where one player is seen destined to go number one. And then within like days, poof, it was almost like the doubt started to creep in. As soon as we heard the name Yuri Sikowski and you're just like, Okay, like this guy's not bad, but like t- number one, first overall, nah, I don't know about that. And then you started to hear it 
I, I started hearing it around like the world championships was when because I because he lit it up at the world championships yeah. at the Olympics and the world championships. And cause if you look at his numbers in, in the, uh, in the, the, uh, where is he playing at? He's in the finish league. Yeah. If you look at his numbers in the finish league. They weren't glowing by any stretch of the imagination, but then you look at him in the, in the Olympics, you look at him at the world championships, dominant dominance. And this is against grown men. So I think that uh, did really well for him. So it was after the world championships is when I placed my wager. And that's when he really started to garner serious interest to go in the top three. And then it was, Hey man, this guy could go number one. And when all said and done, that's exactly what happened. Now what I didn't anticipate was Shane Wright, sliding all the way to fourth overall right into the lap of the Seattle Kraken. What a break they caught. They now have Shane Wright and Matty Breniers as their one-two center for years to come. That's going to be so hard to play against. Like both those guys are just like two-way beasts. Like they, they got so lucky. And, and Shane Wright, did you see the daggers that he oh. reportedly was sending out to Montreal's draft table. Like he's sitting there smiling, taking his photo with the commissioner and, then and she's whatnot. Like, and then daggers. And there's like, Oh wait, one more, one more picture. Okay. 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 Daggers. Loved it. <laughs> it was hilarious, man. Chip on the shoulder for the rest of his career. He said a Montreal size chip on his shoulder for that one, but not only Montreal, also New Jersey and also Arizona. I was surprised that he got through Arizona. I, I kind of had heard that New Jersey, if it wasn't Slavkovsky, they were going to go with the defenseman, uh, whether it was Juracek or Nemich. So I wasn't as surprised with that one. But I am shocked that Logan Cooley was the pick over Shane Wright. Like, I know Cooley was supposed to go number three, but I figured if Wright had dropped to three, they would abandon that and go with Shane Wright with their third pick. Nope, they stick with uh, Logan Cooley, the American kid, and Shane Wright falls to Seattle at number four. It's kind of wild, man. It was a wild opening to the draft. What was even crazier was before Seattle's pick was announced is when Gary Bettman decided to get up there and announce a trade. This was the biggest troll job that Gary Bettman could have done on Montreal Faithful because when he came up there and he's like, I have two trades to announce, got booed. And he said, it's involving Montreal. You might want to hear this. And then everyone cheered. And everyone thought, oh, my God, are we moving up to the fourth overall pick to I get know. Wayne Wright? I was thinking Is that really that. happening right now? Like, that's what I'm thinking. If they're – he's like, it's involved. I'm like, no way. They're about to get Slavkovsky and Shane Wright. And then he trolled them and was like, no, Romanov and a – I think it was 66th overall for pick 13. And then they're flipping pick 13 and another draft pick for Kirby Doc. And I was like, okay, well, it's not Shane Wright, but I mean, Kirby Doc's still a pretty solid player. Mm -hmm. And it all kind of worked out, uh, worked out in the end. But I thought it was a little troll job by, by old Gary Bettman, right when it seemed like you, that's what the trade was going to be announced it, for pick number four, but it had to do with a couple of picks down the road. And, uh, <laughs> Just Kirby double whammy on Shane Wright there, if you really think about it. Because like yeah, his, probably, his, his dude, moment was kind of taken, just kind of swept from under him because all right, you've already fallen in the draft, and then a massive trade happens just as you're about to get picked. Everyone's talking about the trade and hardly that been awkward though. Like, how awkward would that have been? You, you, you leave the guy in the dust at number one, and then you you go back and I guess you still draft him, but they go back up to four and you take him there, like wouldn't there be a little animosity you would think within the organization that they oh, right. didn't feel strongly to take him at one. Like you saw those daggers, man. Like he clearly is like, I'm going to make you pay. We'll see what happens. Um, I hope he has a, a good long career in, in Seattle and they can build a franchise around, uh, around him and, and Matty Breniers. Um, not to say that I think he's a franchise player, but still a good player. Uh, you know, a, a low end one high end number two center is what he projects to be. And, you know, hopefully it goes on to have a good career and also Slavkovsky. We clearly hope for that. Um, so that was kind of the wildness that we saw out of the first, like, 30 minutes of the draft. <laughs> that was where it got wild. And then it kind of settled in from there. And we saw, like, one other trade or a couple other trades go down. And then the Maple Leafs 
decided to get into it. And the Maple Leafs made a deal. So why don't we take a quick break right now, Dave? When we get back, let's get into this. Because out goes Peter Morazic. And I'll tell you why it was worth giving up the first round pick. I'll explain it. Because I believe it was very savvy. And it's something that I had suggested months ago. Months ago. So we'll get into that in just a moment. But before we do, Dave... Let me tell our good folks listening and watching the show about our good friends, betonline.net. It's your number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. Find all your latest sport developments, league reviews, and news. Uh, BetOnline is your continued source for all your sport wagering information, including live sports, esports, betting, and scores. And betonline.net remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including Major League Baseball, MMA, boxing, and even golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. BetOnline, it's where the game starts. Welcome back into the Locked On Lease podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano. Got Dave Morissuti with me. We're reacting to night one of the NHL entry draft. We talked about the Shane Wright slide going from first to fourth. Slavkovsky, the surprise pick at number one. And then there was a trade that went down a little bit later in the night involving the Toronto Maple Leafs. The deal is as follows. Toronto giving up Peter Morazic, the goaltender. Along with their first round pick, pick number 25, in exchange for Chicago's pick number 38. So Mrazic to Chicago, along with their first round pick for pick number 38. Now, the most disingenuous thing was being floated out there by some prominent people. Let's say that, some prominent people in the sports world. And I hate this, so I need to set the record straight. (sighs) It's very disingenuous to say that the Leafs gave away a first-round pick to trade away Mrazek. By definition, did they trade attach a first-round pick to Mrazek? Yeah, of course they did. But what they really did was just move down 13 spots in the draft. And when you look at it that way, it's not anywhere near as egregious as it sounds like, yeah, they trade away a first-round pick to get out of the Mrazek deal. That sounds bad, but when you say, yeah, but it, they only they got a pick back in return, and it was only 13 spots down, so it's really not that egregious when you really think about it, and I think it's actually brilliant because now it gives them cap space. They get out of that deal. You don't got to worry about that, and it gives them all the space they need to go out and make a, a – to sign whichever goaltender they want, whether it's – you know, pick back up talks with Campbell. You can maybe Darcy Kemper, who we know is going to hit the market. Maybe they're going to make a trade. Maybe they want to go a tandem situation. We're going to hear from Kyle Dubas in a minute. He spoke afterwards, and we're going to play that audio. But I thought it was a great, uh, a great deal. It was something that I had uh, suggested like a couple of months ago. Potentially, you know, I would have been willing to give up the first round pick to get out of Mraz's contract, and I stated if you were getting a second back. I also did not think they would be able to get that early of a second round. I thought it'd have to be a little later than that, somewhere in the 40s or 50s. But to only get to have to drop only 13 slots to open up 3.8 million dollars of cap space this year and next year, that's a that's a pretty good piece of work out of uh, out of Kyle Dubas, if you ask me. All right, and the other thing I'm going to mention on top of that for the people who are saying, and I'm not going to name names because. People know who they are. We're kind of crapping all over Kyle Dubas for this. This is not the Patrick Marlowe situation. That's my comparable. What the Leafs did with Patrick Marlowe annoyed me more because they traded Marlowe and a first to get a sixth. To get a sixth. Yeah. Fifth. They didn't they actually gave away a first round pick. Yeah. They ended up recouping a first round pick later on, but that but that's besides the point. What what gets me about the Mrazic thing is, would you rather have Peter Mrazic here for two more years and cost you close to $4 million and hamper what you could do in free agency? No. Or would you say, you know what? Yeah, it was a bad signing. That's kind of admitted to with the trade. Let's move away from him to a team that all they're asking for is exchange 13 spots with us. Done. Like, you, Done. Think, you think about that. Like, just think about it, guys. 
It's 13 spots. It's not like the Leafs took a first round pick and say, you know what? We're fine going in like the 60 or 50 range. It's 13 spots. It's 13 spots. And you got to think that they looked at their draft board and maybe there were some players that had gotten taken earlier. Like I know that, you know, Oslin was a player. Liam Ogren was a player that had been spoken about. Um, Owen Pickering was a guy that had been linked to. So these players who went in the late teens, early 20s that got selected, when Toronto started to see some of those players who had, they had ranked high on their boards, that's probably when they were thinking, okay, if, if one of these guys aren't there, we got a crop of players who we feel comfortable with, where if we drop down 13 spots, we could probably still get one of those guys who we were going to take at 25 anyway. Like once you get to that point in the draft, like outside of the top 15 to 20, and this wasn't necessarily a strong draft anyway, but like from 20 to like, I don't know, 40 to 50, it, they're all basically very similar players. And, and at that point, it, it comes down to development and, and fit and just who you have on your board. But you're not going to get much difference in skill level from a player at 25 to 38. But what you did do was open up 3.8 million in cap space. Right. And and think about the guys that went, at, like even who Chicago picked with that trade. I was thinking, oh, Maybe they'll go and get like a Brad Lambert, who I was kind of keeping an eye on when I saw him drop. Yeah, I was too. I was too. And they ended up taking, I'm going to look, pull it up here because I couldn't remember. Oh, yeah. Sam Rinzel. Right? Yeah, they took the, he was the, was it the, was that the high He's school the high kid? school kid that we were kind of yeah. talking about in the rain. And I just like, so you moved up 13 spots to take a guy that I that Dude, probably was. I'll be honest. I have no idea what the hell Chicago was doing today. They were on crack cocaine. Whatever the hell they were doing, basically, like, they gave away Alex to break it. Straight up gave him away. Like, a first, what do you have, first, second, and third round pick for Alex to break it? A seventh, a second, and a third. Like, what? What? <laughs> it was such a bizarre deal. And it's not even like it was a strong draft either. No. Like, essentially... Like who? Who they end up taking? They took a, a defense. Kevin, uh, uh, Kevin Korchinski. So they took Korchinski, who wasn't even ranked as a top ten player in the draft, anyways. That was considered a little bit of a reach to take him in the at seventh overall. So a you reached on your pick. So Korchinski is is basically your your main return for Alex to bring it. And they were, and if you heard Kyle Davidson talk about it, he was happy about it. I don't I'm know just what. like. But like, there's that, and then they gave up Kirby Doc for uh, the 13th pick, and then like a, another later selection, and then even like the 13th pick was a random player as well. It was somebody who wasn't highly rated. I'm trying to to pull up the draft board right now. If I, I have it, was. Uh, okay. it was uh, Frank Nazar. Frank Nazar. Yeah. So like Nazar. Frank Nazar, who you know, good player. Don't get me wrong, but he wasn't expected to be like a top player where it's like okay is that is worth that Kirby Kirby Doc? yeah like yeah. a third overall pick like really like, like that, that that you basically traded for kirby duck essentially it just what they did today makes no sense and then they moved up 13 spots but took on that contract which i guess they got to find a way to get to the floor anyways the next couple of years because they're gonna suck and they're probably gonna trade kane as well and that'll get rid of even more cap space so I guess they technically do need the cap space as well and probably will need it. So that was more of a win-win situation, but everything that Chicago did today, very questionable, very, very questionable. I'll say that. Um, but Toronto able to rid themselves of the Peter Mrazic deal um, because of it. So, you know, I, kudos to Kyle Dubas. You know, it was a creative way. They didn't have to retain anything on it and they got rid of that, uh, got rid of that pick. So now the Maple Leafs, instead of picking at 25, they didn't pick in the first round, but they will pick early tomorrow. They'll start, uh, and I guess today by the time everyone's listening to this, they had the the six picks into the day, just six picks until they make their their selection at number thirty eight overall. Who are some of the players who uh, who you're looking at that potentially you think the Leafs could be eyeing with this thirty eighth pick? Yeah, there was actually a good tweet about it too. I think it was a Leafs updates. I think that's what the account was called. He was looking at guys that the Leafs put, re- reportedly had like their second interviews with. So right. I got to bring up your our boy here, Jager Furkus. Mm-hmm. He's someone that, you know, again, 
smaller player, but this could be a guy because he has that small size. Immensely skilled. Immensely skilled, though. One of the, like, unbelievable shot. Yeah. Massive skill level. So. He's he's definitely one. Was uh, Debrink at the 38th overall pick? Pardon? Was Debrink at the 38th overall pick? Uh, Good question. He was around there. He was 38, 39th. He was a late 39th. 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 Okay. I was going to say, that'd be funny if he went 38th, because, like, that was the knock on Debrink. It, he was a, a, a goal scorer in junior, but he's so small that he fell all the way to the second round, and it's kind of similar to, to, you know, Jaeger Furcus in, in a way. So, mm-hmm. yeah, he's the player who, if he's there at 38, I think that'd be a solid pick for the Leafs because that's who I want them to take at 25 anyway at that mm-hmm. point in the draft. So if they can get him at 38 and bye-bye Peter Morazic, well done, Kyle. Well done. A mm-hmm. uh, couple other players that uh, that are on that list, I believe Luca Del Bell Belus was on that list too, yes, if I'm not mistaken. He was also there, uh, you know, center from the Mississauga Steelers. He's well, one of did. two. From the bridge? From the bridge? From the bridge. He's one of two centers uh, that people kind of brought up. The other one was Owen Beck. Mm. Uh, but he might be a, a bit of a later uh, look in the draft there as well. Maybe later in the second round, third round there. Um, there there are some players. It, the thing about this draft is that it's going to take some time for these guys to really develop, develop. Yeah. So you're not. Like, Although I think, I think we thought the same about Nick Robertson when he was selected a couple of years ago and a few months later, put up 55 goal holes in the, in the OHL. And then the bubble came around. They're like, Hey, we might actually be able to use this kid in the playoffs. Let's give him a shot. So you never know. I'll say that. You never know. But, yes, it, it, you probably, all of these players, you're looking at a couple of years of development before they, they can really make their mark, um, you know, with the Maple Leafs organization. Yeah, and the only other one, uh, I don't know for where he'll go, but Lane Hudson, he's like the top. Yeah. Um, Corey Perlman has him as his top rated player yeah. available. Yeah, he's a, he's a smaller stature defenseman. I think he's I, like five foot eight. Like he's yeah, a small he's like a Corey guy. Krug was his comparison. Yeah, yeah, and look, not for the least, man. Like they they need just oh, some probably players. not. They have enough of those guys kind of in the system already. Yeah, like if Sandine sticks around, like he's you know small. He's not five eight, but yeah. you know smaller stature who can move the puck. You know Riley's not an overly big dude. He can move the puck. Um, Brody, he can move the puck. Like they, they've got enough guys who are small. I need someone who's just a little bit bigger, a little bit bulkier. And and a guy who wasn't on that list, but I've talked about him before, and thir- pick 38 would be right in that range where I think he deserves to go, and that's Tristan Luno. Um, Tristan Luno, a, a defenseman from the, the, from the queue. I had him at the prospects game. Just a really smart player. O-Dog looked at him and said, this guy plays like Noah Dobson. He's got a, you know, he's, he's, Slightly below average skater, which is, I think, the the biggest knock on him as to why he wasn't a first round defenseman. Um, and he, but that also could be the fact that he's recovering from an injury. But if you put him in the system with the Maple Leafs, who've done a really good job, like Barb Underhill has really helped players learn to skate. You know, essentially, um, if you can do that with Luno, he's got the smarts and he's got the skill level to be, you know, potentially a top four right shot defenseman who's got a little bit of size to him so tristan luno is another name that i'd be looking at at number 38 uh so th- th- that's a couple of guys who who i think we'd be kind of circling and and seeing if the if they're still available at 38 perhaps uh one of those names will be called by kyle dubas uh in the second round later on today all right dave Let's take a break. Let's actually hear from Kyle Dubas when we return. He spoke after the draft, after round one. Let's hear what he had to say. Probably talked about, um, you know, what went into the deal to eventually move on from Peter Morazic. What's next? What he feels about the the next crop of players that could be uh, available tomorrow. So we'll hear from Kyle Dubas when we return here on the Locked On These podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. 
Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. We're your hosts here at Locked On Leafs, a daily Maple Leaf-centric podcast. Hopefully, you're enjoying today's show. If it's your first time tuning in, please subscribe, whether you're listening via audio or on YouTube. Uh, subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, let us know down below your thoughts on the deal. Let us know if you think that the Maple Leafs made a good trade, moving back from 25 to 38, getting rid of the Mrazic deal, and also the guy you're hoping they select at pick number 38. Let us know in the comment section below. Uh, or you can hit us up on Twitter if you're listening um, via podcast form at Mickey underscore Canuck or at D underscore Morissuti on Twitter. All right, let's hear from Kyle Dubas. Let's pull up the Dubas, uh, the Dubas video here. This is him in Montreal after round one of the NHL entry draft, uh, speaking with the media. So why don't we go ahead and play that? And much like we did on yesterday's show, if there's something that we find striking, we'll just kind of hit pause and, and talk about it a little bit. So let's hear from Kyle Dubas now. Obviously no pick traded the uh, 25th pick and uh, Peter Mraz to Chicago for pick 38 down uh, down 13 spots in the draft and we'll go in the morning Can you take us through how you, you view the goaltending decision in front of you now and, and why you elected to trade up versus keeping Peter uh, I think the decision Chris was just we uh, we wanted to have the most flexibility possible uh, going into, into into next week and also you know just in gathering the information here throughout the week not only not only as we went into into next week but also um with, with the different trades that are available and, and into the trade market. So we just want to make ourselves as flexible as possible, um, create the cap space for ourselves and, and, uh, and proceed. So uh, that's what we were able to do tonight. And, um, you know, obviously don't want to uh, move back in the draft, but, you know, our analysis of it was that it was a, it was a good move versus what we were asking a team to do, and that's what we did. The part here was when he said, looking at how the trade market was kind of unfolding and having the flexibility to me, it seems like there might be something in the works here. There might be something where, you know what? We need that $4 million in cap space, not only to make the trade, but to make other moves to go along with it. Like, are you hinting John Gibson here, pal? I'm not hinting John Gibson because I heard that that's becoming less likely. Yeah, be the yeah I heard that as well. And I'm Gregor not, was kind of like, uh, I don't see that happening. No, I just don't. I don't think he's the target anymore. Just because I heard that Anaheim, Anaheim thought the Leafs didn't have enough to offer hmm. a trade. Okay. They didn't like our our potential deal, Mike. I no, know. they didn't like it. Nah, well, stuff it. Keep your goaltender who's been on the downswing for the last three years then. Yeah. Keep, uh, Keep finding it. ways to stay in the middle of the pack with your draft <laughs> as you try to do whatever it is you're trying to do. So I think it's interesting for him to say that. Uh, well, I mean, it's obvious they want the four mil- close to $4 million in flexibility, but it's also to say that the trade market – I mean, we saw the trade market intensifying. We almost saw a Matt Murray to Buffalo trade that – Yeah. Almost, if you really think about it, almost like that. Have, the the Brinket trade wouldn't have happened if that happened. No. So oh, Matt Murray, Matt Murray, that sorry, Matt Murray deserves a statue right now in Ottawa. For sure. Yeah, essentially he does. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, let's see what else uh, Kyle has to say. I, th- I think f- discussing free agency a week out is a good way to get me in trouble. Um, um, but I uh, look forward to discussing them next week live here with everybody. <laughs> you guys obviously had a lot of faith in Peter to a three-year deal. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, goaltending can be so variable year to year. That said, you know, he got injured in the first game came back from that injury we were you know tried to be very patient with him and tell him to be patient got hurt in the second game that he played uh and then was out for quite a while and then just couldn't get on track from there 
after the trade deadline, looked like he was getting on track and then got injured again. And so injury, I think, derailed it more than anything. And I think it's tough for a goaltender uh, to get everything, especially in a new place, in a new city, a new team, uh, get every get their legs under them when, um, when, when injury is sort of prevailing. So I think if, if we look back on it, that would be probably the key. Um, Josh, but you know, uh, obviously we, we hope every signing we make is going to work out optimally. But um, you know, not all of them do uh, and have. So the new cap space now, Kyle. Can you take another run at that cap? Uh, I, I don't. I think all of our with the cap space we have now, there's there's every option is available to us, Pierre. So um, whether that's Jack or or the others uh, later next week um, or via trade. So uh, I think it opens up a lot for us. Uh, you see with the trades today the and, and the signings today that the the number of chairs are starting to to go by the wayside and and so I, I think our situation would be enticing for any goaltender and so we'll see how um, how tomorrow plays out relative to trade and then um, you know obviously we, we know Jack well he's been a part of our program we'll stay in touch with him and uh, meet with him when I get back uh, to Toronto and and roll from there all right interesting interesting Mm-hmm. So who's who's left? Because like you said, you know, the, based on what's going on, there's not a whole lot of seats left on the goalie train, um, both with teams looking for goalies, but also there's also not a whole lot of goalies that are out on the market either at this point. Um, so at this point, like who's left? So Darcy Kemper's going to market. We know that. So you could circle back on Jack Campbell. Yep. Billy Huso still an option out of, of St. Louis, assuming nothing transpires there between him and the Blues. Mark Andre Fleury got scooped up by Minnesota. Those yeah. damn jerks. So he's off. He's off. Uh, off the list. Alexander Georgiev got traded to Colorado. He's off the list, which also means those two teams who are looking for goalies are also um, no longer going to be doing that. Um, Casey DeSmith signed back in, in Pittsburgh, so they clearly won't be looking for a goalie either. Mm-hmm. So, like, who else is out there? I guess potentially Varlamov in a trade, but I read that that's not something he's looking to do. He's got a, a no trade clause and he's not looking to really move off the island. Don, John Gibson doesn't sound like that's going to happen either. So, like, there's not many other options. And the one that did get brought up today was Matt Murray. Matt Murray got brought up again today for the Maple Leafs. Uh, They were kicking tires. Nothing came to fruition. And I wonder if, um, you know, if, if, if something happens there. It doesn't sound like Ottawa's willing to buy him out. It looks like they'd be willing to retain salary because that's what was happening in the Buffalo deal. And if they're willing to retain salary, would that entertain you at all? Even if they retain 50%, it would still be, uh, I believe, what, 3.125 on the cap if they were to retain 50% of his cap. At 3.125 for the next couple of years, how would you feel about Matt Murray if a sweetener is also included in that deal? Well, the problem I have with that is we're talking about a goaltender we just the Leafs traded out a goaltender, and Kyle Dubas kept saying injury, injury, injury. Like couldn't stop saying injury in that. Sorry, but Matt Murray has also had the same issues from his days in Pittsburgh. To I Ottawa. know, I find it very confusing as well. Why there's so much intrigue, or at least discussions about Matt Murray and the Maple Leafs? It's like they they know his injury history and how he's not very reliable. To be no. quite honest with you over really his entire career, actually. So why they're so keen on bringing him in, I, I just, I don't get it. Like, I hope this is just all smoke. I really do. It doesn't sound like it, because it actually sounds like there's been some meaningful discussions about it. Um, we were talking about this a month or so ago and saying, okay, if he gets bought out, bring him in on a cheap deal, like yeah. bring him in like a million, million and a half or something like that. But at a number of over three million for two years, I mean, I don't know, man. I don't know if I, I like that a whole lot unless there's a real good sweetener coming back. Or you tell Ottawa, find a third tar- find a third team that takes oh, That's half. true, too. That's takes true, too, half. actually. Yeah, if you find a third team, then they could take off another 
kind of another half of that deal. Now it does sound a little appetizing at that point. So maybe, yeah. maybe it's still in the cards if they get super creative and they find a third team to kind of park some of that cap space uh, and, and get an asset for it. So maybe, but like that, those are really all the options at this point. Right. Yeah. And the other thing too is Ottawa is pushing to move off Matt Murray because they got oh, three yeah. goalies. They yeah. don't want to carry three goalies. And no. if they get rid of Matt Murray's contract, they save a lot of money because Anton Forsberg's on a pretty de- reasonable deal. And Philip Gustafson is on the last year of his of a really cheap deal too. So they save a lot of money and a lot of cap space by doing it because they say Ottawa says they want to push forward. Well, it's going to hard to push forward when you have a $6 million cap hit. Well, 6.25 and Matt Murray. So if I'm the Leafs, if you really want Matt Murray, you tell Ottawa, we don't want him at that price. So you got to figure out, and they can wait them out. If it means that eventually Ottawa has to bite the bullet and buy them out, so be it. Don't, I think you have to let Ottawa make the move. Ottawa has to kind of show a bit of desperation here. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. It's 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 interesting. Uh, the, the but it's not my number one option, by the way. Just so you know. No. All right, let's continue. Uh, this has been a discussion sort of ongoing um, and really picked up yesterday and into today with uh, with Kyle Davidson. Oh, we, I mean, there, there were a number of players that, that uh, we would have liked to have been there. And then once they, once they came off and once we knew what the, the options were, Josh, we, d- we decided to make the move. Yeah, that makes sense. The, the part of the process of going through it with Wes was, do we have, is there, is there a large enough collection of players that, you know, we felt that if we move back just the 13 spots, could we get somebody there that's in that next range? And, and that's what we felt. And we feel good about that now especially that that the the picks have come off the board between 25 and 32 uh so you know you, you sit there and it, it it's a big ask of the amateur scouting staff because they pour a lot into it and i don't like to do that but i didn't want to move anything outright and so moving back was the best option you see edmonton uh, did the same uh, after we did what's your confidence level of the, the goalies that you do have under contract or the rights to you were sort of talking sure. about the other day but sure well, I, I think, it, I mean, Eric Shelgren came in when we needed him most in a, in a high-pressure situation and performed extraordinarily well for us. So we obviously like Eric. Joe Wall is coming back off of injury, but he performed well during the year last year as well. And, you know, that's that's where we're at at, at this moment. So um, we've got a lot of opportunity there, and it's it should be an, an interesting um, option for any goaltender that's, that's looking. Do you have to... I mean, sure. I think like every team, we'd, we'd love to have the definitive uh, number one. Um, but, you know, we've, we're, our goal would be to have the best tandem we possibly can, Mike. So that's what we're that's what we're looking to do. Even if one would be regarded as a definitive number one, having the insurance there, we feel like we have the younger guys coming with Shelgren Wall and then the, and then the two uh, Russian prospects that we picked in the, in the subsequent drafts. Plus, we've got what we feel is a good collection of guys that are on American League deals in Dryden McKay, uh, uh, Cavalin, and Petrozelli. So we're, we're pretty excited about where we're going with that. It's just it's going to take time, and we have to be patient, develop them properly versus rush them in. Pause that there, Dave. Pause that there. Um, so that sounds like tandem, which would make sense, right? So they're going to tandem, but so I wonder what's what what else is there then? So is it maybe Billy Huso and Matt Murray? Like, is that the tandem that they're looking to go for? And because I I can't see them going tandem and then only getting one goalie and then thinking that Shalgren or Joe Wall could be the other guy. So now you're thinking you got to get two of these players who are available. Yeah, this is, this is the part that I was a little confused about because it was almost like, okay, you, you're, you feel comfortable moving on Mirazik because you feel like Joseph Wall and Eric Shalgren can give you something better. Maybe in a 20 games. Sure. Maybe you can rely on them for 20 games, even if you kind of split the duties between the two of them, which I don't think they want to do. Like they want that. You think of that backup, maybe they're trying to think if we go with a younger guy, maybe he provides a little bit more upside, but it's just like the number one guy 
you're kind of suggesting that he's got to play at least 50 games, 50, 55 games, because you're going to trust a younger unproven goalie to go 30, 40 games. And like a yeah. true, I, I just don't see that. Me either. And I'm wondering if that's just him kind of also telling the younger goalies that there's an opportunity and like, doesn't want to put in a, like himself in a position to say, no, nah, I don't think our young goalies are ready yet. Like, I don't think he wants to kind of, I think he wants to make sure that he's playing the smart and that the young goalies have something to work towards. Right. They're not working towards, all right, Joseph Wool's not thinking I'm going to battle for the number one job at the Marlins because he's technically played for that before. I want to make a spot out of camp. Mm-hmm. So I think I think maybe that's where Kyle Dubas is trying to go here, and he's trying to tell these two goalies, we might pick up another goalie, but really we want you guys to push for a spot. Yeah, I I don't know how I feel about that, though. I'd, I'd rather there be two NHL-caliber goalies who are better than those guys right now. problem is finding one, right? Uh, yeah, I know. Like, the more and more I think about it, the more and more Billy Huso makes a lot of sense around, you know, $4 million. I think uh, the the contract, like the comparable is like Chris Drieger, right? Someone who had one breakout year and then hit for agency. And he got about, I think it was three times three last year. I think Huso will probably get a little bit more than that. So maybe three and a half as high as potentially like three, seven, five or four on a three-year deal. And if you can do that, and then maybe you can add yourself like a Grice or a Holpe, like one of those veteran backups yeah. um, to be your your tandem guy, a guy who's been part of tandems. Halak is a name I've thrown out there as well as part of those guys. Like the more and more I think about it, that feels like what we'll see. I, I don't know why, just like in, in my gut, I feel like that's where it'll end up. It'll be some combination of Billy Huso and a veteran tandem like a veteran goalie who's been part of a tandem before who knows what it's like to to be in a bit of a, a split who you would feel comfortable playing 30 to 35 games and let's not forget you're not going into a season thinking you you need three goalies you should be going thinking i need four because the leaves oh, at one point needed four they also went to their fifth option at one point like yeah like michael hutchinson played a game for the leaves last year Played a couple games, actually. So yeah. let's not have that happen again, right? You're going to need these guys. Joseph Wolm and uh, Eric Schalgren might still end up playing, even if the Leafs get a tandem, like you suggest. Of well, two probably games. at some points. Injuries? Right? Like, like just they, there's bound to be injuries, right? Bound oh. to be injuries. So at some point, they may have to play a game or two um, just based on injury. But I, I, I think that... I wouldn't feel comfortable unless they get themselves like a proven number one. Yeah. I wouldn't feel comfortable with Shalgren or wall as the tandem next to him. Yeah. You I'm okay with Shalgren and, and wall are saying, you know what? 20 games max. Like and, if you yeah. get Gibson, I would feel comfortable because I know he can play 60 games. I'd feel yeah. comfortable with wall or Shalgren next to Gibson. But if you get a Huso, you'd have to do or a Blackwood or a Matt Murray. Now I don't feel as comfortable because I don't think they'll be able to. Even get Jack Campbell, like I don't think you can feel cam- comfortable with Campbell for six. No, games. I don't either. Even even if they bring back Campbell, I think they're going to have to double down on a veteran tandem goaltender. The problem is this is also what got them in trouble with Campbell uh, with Morazic in the first place. They brought in Morazic because yeah. they wanted that other veteran to be beside Jack. Campbell. You're right. You're right. I I just mm, like. Holby played for two million this year on a one year deal. I can't see him asking for much more than that. You got I think if you're Kyle Dubas, you gotta be very careful with the term you dish out to a goalie. Yes. Yeah. Like I think this is a cautionary tale for him, this Morazic deal. Yeah. Where so, it's like you, you can give term to your one A, but your one B, your tandem, one year. Gotta be a one year prove it deal, one year max. See what happens. Some somebody brought up uh, just a final one here. The uh, there was someone out in Vegas uh, brought up maybe like a Logan Thompson, who mm, as I, what though? Like is oh, Logan Thompson much better than Shalgren or Joe Wall? He's got a lot more NHL experience, in my opinion, than the than they did. Um, out of necessity, not out of but you know, but being good and 
garnering or earning those starts. Now the problem is, is he's signed, so it's not like he's a free agent. Yeah, they'd have to trade for him. But. They have to trade for him. But Vegas at one point were in a very tr- in big trouble of missing out of the play. I mean, they missed the playoffs, but they're like when they were in serious trouble, he kept the minute. And like this was a Vegas team that was banged up. I'm not saying go out of your way to trade for Logan Thompson. I'm just saying like that's another option. You can go out and find another goalie that maybe is looking for a little more opportunity than just being like like Robin Leonard. You're going to expect to play 60 games. Maybe Logan Thompson wants to play a little bit more. Yeah. Right. Maybe. Yeah. But I I heard that name from. I can't remember where I heard it from, but no, I I do think that if you're going to do it. You just have to be very careful of what's the money and what's the term. Like when he brought up Jack Campbell's name, a lot of people would be happy to have Jack Campbell back. But what's the number? I'll say this. I don't know if you caught a lot of the reporting coming out the last 24 hours on Jack Campbell. The numbers that were being reported a couple of weeks ago have since like shrank. Have you noticed that? Well, look at Darcy Kemper's availability too makes it really hard for Jack Campbell because Darcy Kemper, while he did not have a great playoff, he was still on well, the Stanley Cup. Not, not only that, not only that, I just think in general, like it sounds like teams are only willing, even if Kemper, or whatever happens with Kemper, like Kemper aside, like I, I, from the reporting I've seen, both Jersey and Edmonton are prioritizing Campbell over Kemper anyway. From what yeah. I, from what I've read, I've, and it sounds like they're only willing to go like three, four years at five million. Yeah. Which, I Toronto think, now might be able to compete with that now that that Mrazic deal is gone. Yes. So we'll see. we'll see. I also think the Philip Grubauer situation is a cautionary tale. No one's getting Grubauer money, I'll tell you that. Well, that because of what happened with Philip Grubauer. I think Not only that, the Phil Grubauer makes nearly as much as Markstrom, and that's insane. Yeah, that was I was that was the big Seattle just saying we have so much money, take whatever the hell you want, come play for us. And come stick it to the Colorado Avalanche, who then were just like, Okay, we have a lot of prospect and draft capital. Let's just go out and get another goalie. Exactly. And then they went and won a Stanley Cup. So and then they they, well. And then they did it again with the Georgiev uh, trade. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, we'll see, though. It's going to be an interesting day two of the NHL draft. Leafs pick at 38. Could there be some more movement? Perhaps. We'll see. Uh, but that's going to do it for us here today, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked on Leafs podcast on all podcasts and platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore Maura Sudi, go ahead, leave a like and a comment down below on YouTube, your thoughts on day one of the NHL draft and how Kyle Dubas did and what you want to see on day two of the draft. Uh, We'll be back with another episode tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, or I guess we'll be back. Eh, Maybe we'll do one tomorrow, potentially a special episode tomorrow since it's draft day. So maybe we will put one out there, Um, if not Monday, but probably tomorrow. Check back regardless. There'll be an episode for you. Uh, But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked on Leaf.